All right, merci, merci, salam, chetori, dadash, dusteman, shalizi. How you doing, brother? Salam, salam, dadash. Thank you very much, my brother Hano. Thank you for bringing me onto the platform. It's the boy Shalizi Habibi King, the king of the Middle East in the building. Thank you for having me. Man, I I got to tell you, man, just uh, was it sometime, I think, last week, I stumbled on through social media, Shalizi, a wonderful MC of Persian and uh, Muslim background from the East Coast. Then I find out that he's actually from the streets of Shaolin, a.k.a. Staten Island. And I'm getting the hype and hype the more I listen to his content. And I'm like, man, I got to talk to this dude. And he ends up responding to me. And I'm like, man, this, this is like a real life person. You know, there, there are a lot of bouts out there, like, but this is a real dude. So there are a million things that stuck out to me and that I wanted to do. You know, my best friend is Irani. That's why I don't speak Farsi fluently, but, you know, much love and respect to the culture. And I recognize that Shah, you know, means king off the bat. That is one of the words I do know. Can you tell us a little bit of how you got your MC name? and a little bit of your, your relation with the Wu-Tang. You even gave me a little shout out with ODB, the old dirty bastard, and I love that too. Oh yeah, he's right here. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yo, yo. <laughs> nah, um, so how I got my name Shalizi was pretty simple. Uh, when I was just really starting out like professionally, uh, I was like 19. And I was just interning at different recording studios. I just wanted to get my foot in the door and really just get that industry experience, whether it be, you know, learning about the politics, being in the, in the environment, or just like uh, learning how to really create records because there's an art to creating records. And uh, when I was in the studio, one of the studios, uh, my real name's Ali, and they would, my nickname, they would nickname me Lizzy. That was the uh -huh. thing. First, it started with Alizi, and then it just they dropped the A, and they just started calling me Lizzy. So uh, as I was just moving along in the process, I was just like, you know what? Let's just bring my two worlds together. Like hip hop dogged me the name Lizzy, and I'm gonna go into my cultural roots and like Sha, because I didn't want to be like King Lizzy or some shit. Like yeah. That. So I was like, all right, Sha Lizzy, it rolls off the tongue real dope, and you know, once you type in Sha Lizzy. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. You didn't say Ayatollah Lizzy, you didn't say Khomeini, you said Shah, you know, which is an homage a little bit for those who don't know to the pre-revolution a little bit, right? Before some of the, the politics with Reagan and all that trying to intervene with the Iran-Contras for those who don't know. And, you know, my homie and I, we always talk about there's so many deep connections. My fam's from Ethiopia, right? And uh, even in the 200s, there's a Persian philosopher, Mani, the guy who founded Manichaeism. And he was given a shout out to Ethiopia. It was called Aksum at the time and, you know, and Persia or Iran. So, you know, we always talk about, you know, some cats just be saying, oh, we was kings and all this. But like we legitimately have these tangible historical figures that we can talk about and, and point to. And, you know, Kendrick gave a shout out to the Ethiopian king, the Nugus, in, in his lyrics for the fact that you were presenting this image of the, of the Persian king. That stood out to me because I don't see a lot of people repping that from the longest. What I try to do with my channel, the philosophy of art and science, and, and what I try to do elsewhere in my life is I have, I think like a, a lot of people, all these different parts in my life. And a lot of people, they compartmentalize it. They say, this goes here, this goes there. But you say, well, blam, let me put it all together in the same place. And what, what, what gave you that, like, for me, that, that, that speaks of like confidence. Like you got this East Coast swag about you, but you, you got this confidence and swagger that you're not afraid and you're unapologetic that like, it's like, if somebody's just a Persian or somebody's just Muslim or somebody's just a hip hop head, they might, they might not just feel that thing, but you put all those things together and it's it like has a very unique narrative and story to it. Well, yeah, you know, for me, it was most important to me was just making sure that uh, whatever I do, it was going to be authentic and I have fun with it because if I'm not having fun with it, then it's, it's a job. And if it's a job, then, why am I doing this? I can go get I can go get dozens of jobs and make money, but because uh, I wanted to stay true to who I am, and I feel like it's a story that wasn't really told told in in hip hop. And me being such a student of it, I felt like you know what, I got the skill set, I got the talent, I could do this. 
For sure. And can you tell us a little bit of what it was like to grow up in the streets of, of Shaolin and what level of influence? Obviously, you got the ODB like figure right there. Like what level of influence did they have on you? Uh, I mean, I was proud just just being from like Staten Island and stuff. You know, we, we have this like reputation of just, um, you know, we, we're constantly called like the forgotten borough and like, you know what I mean? We kind of like the, the ugly stepchildren of like the other five of the five boroughs and things so when obviously when i did my history search and stuff as i was growing up because you know wu-tang was like one generation before me so mm -hmm. i was like oh like these dudes really came from staten island like yo these dudes weren't even that far away from me like that and they're like to me they're like the rap beatles in my eyes so uh, i was just like damn like yo i want to like I, I was inspired by that you know what i mean and i was like yo i could I could carry that torch that they pretty much started. Yeah, man. I um I had dreams of being an MC one day. I never put enough effort into it back in the day, but you know, I've always been a hip hop head. And uh, that's why you saw, you know, kill a deacon in the title, because I'm not a priest, but I am a deacon. So I, th I threw that little the little title there. And some some of my friends jokingly would call that because we were Wu-Tang fans from way back. And, you know, there's so many affiliates like kill a priest, which is that's, you know, uh, obvious o homage to. But, you know, it's it's interesting the way they they mixed, you know, the the Asian culture with the black culture and then all the all the different cultures you're mixing the title kind of project that i bought and that i really put some spins on to just now before i got into the rest of your projects was beans rice and lamb can you tell us a little bit of how you thought the the title for that that made me hungry first off so i appreciate that and uh, the so um like i tell people all the time everything that i i do is uh i try to have like a middle eastern influence and in everything that i do with my projects of course like that's like to stay on brand with everything that we do. So uh, Beans, Rice, and Lamb was just kind of like this whole thing that uh, my friend, uh, who's also a producer of mine, my man Life on My Ave, uh, who produced the entire album uh, alongside with me, he, you know, he's of Puerto Rican descent. I'm Persian, so it's like my people, and I'm sure people all over the, the whole region eat lamb. And uh, my, my man over here, he's, he eats beans and rice. So we kind of just brought our worlds together. So it was like, yo, what if we do this? And that's, that's really how we did it. That's how we was like, oh, this, was, this could work. See, that's dope. I was acting, I was actually asking my homie, the Irani, shout out to Rastin. I was asking him, what's the name of a Persian dish that has those things? Because I've eaten Persian food on multiple occasions. I couldn't think of like the name. He was probably stumped. Yeah, he was stumped. He was stumped. He was like, for sure, lamb. But he's like, I don't know about the beans and rice. And I know that's like an Asian thing or a Hispanic thing. So yeah. thank you for bringing clarity to that. Like, I, I didn't know the name to it. And I was like, was like, I'm usually uh, I'm usually really good. Like, I know about the lavash. You know what I'm saying? I know oh, about the OG, yes. the, the fruit roll up. What's the name of the OG fruit roll up? I'm slipping my lava name. Shack. Lava, lava Shack. Yeah, I knew the names were close. I used to get those names confused. The bread versus the fruit roll up. Uh-huh. Yeah, so so that's dope, man. But I want to talk about some of the specific things that stuck out to me in Beans, Rice, and Lamb. But before that, one of the things that really shocked me is you had a Strictly for My Habibis, if I'm not mistaken, also released this year. So you've been hella productive. What's it been like, you know, quarantining, you know, not being able to travel and stuff in terms of your uh, productiveness and your creativity of your craft? Well, uh, when I made Strictly for My Habibis, that was um, pre-COVID. And then and I was working on beans, rice, and lamb around the same time. So it, okay. and then when we dropped it, it was actually during the um, the the pandemic and stuff. So it made sense for me because I was like, "Yo, we gotta feed the streets." So it's like we'll have material out, we'll have content out. Can't tell us nothing. So I mean, right now I'm working on a new project as we speak, and nice. just as far as inspiration goes, you know. Uh, you just gotta, I've seen it work two ways. I've seen for some people, it's like they had no inspiration because they gotta be outside. And then some people are just locked in working. So for me, I just work through it. I just work on new beats, new concepts, and just keep going, progressing through it and stuff. That's dope. And is it like, is it like parts of your life that you are trying to talk about and highlight that's like a little fictionalized or is it like, okay, I'm trying to do this with this project versus this with this project. Like how does it, how, how methodical is it versus like, you know, just leaving room to what you feel in the moment and stuff. I try to give myself space to really like how I feel at the time. Really. I don't, 
I don't like to move too methodically. I feel like every project has its own challenge. You know what I mean? Like I remember when we was doing like strictly for my Habibis, like for me, it was trying to find out that that balance of like, okay, uh, what's like, we want to make it conscious, but we don't want to make it super conscious where people get put to sleep. <laughs> You get what I'm saying? Like, I'm just yeah. keeping with you. Like, yo, there's, you know, you don't want to be super conscious to the point where people are like, all right, skip, skip. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that's what we thought of the idea of Alicia's Jam and just having an Alicia Keys sample playing in there and have something that's going to touch on the on the girl demographic and stuff to show you that I got that reach. Uh, when we did Beans, Rice, and Lamb, that had its own energy to it. You know what I'm saying? That was like, you know, the beats playing and it's just like it was inspiring me so you hear a song like halal kush and things like I, I i first heard the beat and all i'm thinking is just like oh shit this could be a cool idea and stuff and i just i just mix up some ideas and things so like halal kush like obviously there's no such thing as halal kush but, <laughs> but, yet. right but having said that I like smoking weed. So my whole mm -hmm. thing was like, you know, I, I could bring those worlds together. Like, you know what I mean? Like me, marijuana culture, uh, hip hop, and then just like this whole idea of halal kush and things, which we got a video on the way for that. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it too, bro. As soon as I saw the title track, it brought back to me Kush and Corinthians again, like a Kendrick, cause I'm a LA yeah. dude, you know what I'm saying? So like, Explain to people for those, I, I'm sure most people know, but just if, if people ain't hip, just break them down like the culture. What is halal? Like, what does that mean? So people can know that juxtaposition. So so halal is like, it's equivalent to kosher, basically. Uh, but when, um, for, for in my culture, when, when it comes to like making lamb, for instance, there's a certain way that we execute this lamb. So we know that when we're consuming the lamb that we've uh, executed it properly where like the blood hasn't gotten into certain parts of the meat that might be affecting of uh, us, the person. So Yeah, I, sp I spent a day in Dubai one time on my way to Ethiopia to visit my fam out there. And I remember I had like a genuine like halal shawarma for the first time, some like chicken tarna. And I was like, whoo, I didn't know what went down. Like, I don't know, like you said, the humane slaughtering process. I don't know exactly what it was, but that was the most fire shawarma I'd ever had in my life. And it's not like it doesn't exist. You know, LA is a diverse place. We got many types of food. So yeah, that that process, like when you said halal, it, it made me think about that. Like it's almost... You know, I almost expect you one day to have a your own strain, you know, like Nip Hustle had his own strain. <laughs> Yo, listen. <shh. laughs> okay, okay. I guess I'm being a little prophetic there. An another one of those juxtapositions that you had on beans, uh, rice, and lamb is Allahu Akbar's, right? So Allahu Akbar, for those who don't know, God is great. And then yeah. you threw that in to say bars, like the, for the various meters of the poetry of hip hop. Can you tell us what went into that song? Oh, that was just uh, when I first heard the beat, uh, Ad was just playing me a whole bunch of beats and stuff. And then he came across that and then he quickly skipped it. And I was like, yo, why'd you skip it? Run it back. And because I heard the sample, it was like a Turkish sample. I found out it was a Turkish sample being used. And I was like, oh, shit, <laughs> this is it right here. Because I, I, I was I was looking, patiently waiting, looking for a, a beat that had a Middle Eastern theme to it, because at that time, I had not really rapped on a Middle Eastern themed beat or anything, or at least sample based. Like it's just been your like, lyrics. Before that, yeah. it was just your lyrics. Now it's yeah. like the actual the vibe of the music. Yeah. So then, like the vibe of the track, and I'm hearing, I'm hearing the the sample, and I was like, oh my god, like yo, this is this got international appeal to it. So then that's when I, I started thinking of this whole idea and stuff in my mind, and I started cooking up these bars and things and like the, the the themes that I'm talking about where I'm saying like um, back uh, one hand wash the other both washing down each other back touching my back both know we got us covered who gonna hold us down no government really love us you know what I'm saying so it's like it's really touching on those topics that has that international struggle appeal to it oh oh yeah man I mean Things was popping off a few years ago with the Arab Spring, right, in so yeah. many different places. And that, you know, that goes into Africa, too, as well as, like, Asia Minor, like, all, all these different places. By the way, thank you for letting me know with Turkish. I didn't know what it was. I'm pretty good. I'm pretty nice with languages, but I couldn't figure out what it was. And I knew it wasn't Farsi. I was trying to figure that yeah. out. Yeah, because yeah. you know what it is, too? One of my fans hit me up from Turkey. 
that's how I found out. Yeah. Because I knew it was Middle Eastern. I already knew from the from you know you could tell like with language and linguistics that you could tell like oh this sounds Arabic or this yeah. sounds like yo this sounds somewhere regional around us not too far but not too close either but it's there and so so when I put the album out I didn't realize like first of all I didn't realize how much feedback I was getting from it and then on top of that then I had people from Turkey actually hit me up like yo I heard that song yo and I forgot I'm sorry I don't know the artist's name but it's like yo I love how you sample such and such on Allah Akbar so I was like oh <laughs> yeah. and, and that's so dope right because through the internet we wouldn't even expect it. I mean, you probably partially expect it, but you don't think like somebody in Turkey is doing that. Like I look at my podcast and my YouTube and stuff and I look at the demographics and I see stuff randomly in Saudi Arabia and stuff. I'm like, word, like there's somebody out there, you know? So yeah. I, like, that's so exciting to me. And when, when all this passes over, you know, I like, I'm sure you got a, a deep fan base out there, especially if you're sampling stuff like that, they're already used to you. So you shouting out the tradition, but then you, you bring in that new, new too, with your, with your lyrics and with the fire, that line really stuck out to me that you just said that no government really uh, loves us. Like it's so funny. It's a, it's a time where sometimes MTs are, are choosing up. And they're picking, you know, one of the major parties, this or that. But for me, some of the most fire MCs, you know, whether it was like Killer Mike or whether it was NWA back in the day, you know, they were mad at the whole system. They weren't trying to talk the system and, you know, take take pictures with like all the politicians. It, it was such like a, a generic call. Right. What, what did you mean by that? Because I, I felt that on a deep level. Well, yeah, I mean, it was just it was just an observation. It was a, a cultural and societal uh, observation because it's like, think about it. No government really love us like this country might tolerate us because, you know, we bring something to the table. You know, we come from yeah. an educational background with doctors, with lawyers. A lot of us turn into engineers. Some of us fix their, fix your iPhones. We cook you halal food, whatever the case is. <laughs> so we're tolerable in that sense where it's like we bring something to capitalist America and stuff. And then on the other side, back home, you know, we run away from home because of like political situations or like societal issues. You can't get a job. Job opportunities are low. Don't have no opportunity to make no real money. So it's like, damn, like no government really love us like that. Because if they did, we'd be back in the homeland. Yeah, you know? we wouldn't have come here in the first place. And that's so funny. I love that you brought up education. It's a stereotype, for example, in Ethiopian communities, I think is common to, to immigrant communities, especially, you know, our fan bams that came in the 70s and 80s and all that. But it's like they want you to be either an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, what they view to be like a pragmatic, easy job, a life of no struggle. So you could build whatever family and they could live vicariously through you. Now, obviously, when somebody listens to you speak here in this setting and other settings or they listen to your music, they're going to tell that you were very educated dude. Dude. So it's obvious after the fact, but when you were coming up, like you said, you started when you were 19 till now, what was the type of feedback you were getting from your fam bam and like local like community? Was was everybody mad supportive or was it reluctant or how, how was that? I mean, when I was first starting out, you know, like every every MC will just just to give you some background for context, I was doing it professionally at 19, but then like I was rapping since I was 13, but Nobody nice. really counts that and stuff like that. But yeah. when I was 19, that was when I had my recording studio experiences and stuff. So when you first start now, naturally, for most MCs, you're trying to find your voice. So yeah. around those times, I mean, I spent a good like three, four years trying to like, I, I would make an array of different records. Like I'd make uh, a lyrical record, I'd make a... a a girl record, a party record, just trying to figure out, okay, you know, what's my niche? What works, yeah. what doesn't work and stuff. And uh, like the feedback at the time, it was like, okay, you know, whatever. Like, you know what I'm saying? It was no heads were turning at the time. It was like, mm -hmm. fine. and then at the time also, I had a, I was known for being just like the engineer kind of dude. I was like recording a lot of artists and things. But- Oh, so you were on the back end too. Yeah, I was on the back end and stuff. Uh, so then, after a while, I would say by like my fourth year, I figured out my voice and stuff. And then that's when I was like, that's when I made a song called Quran Bars. 
And like you can find that on my YouTube. It was like one of my first first videos I made. I had uh -huh. a baby face. I had no beard, <laughs> nothing like that. I had the little two millimeter mustache going hey. on, and all that. You know what I mean? Um, but that was the song that got heads turning, and that was kind of like the blueprint. Like, yo, from now on, this is how the records need to sound moving forward. Like, this is that's your that's your thing. You you the only one. This is your tailor made style. No one else can come in your lane. Like, go. That's beautiful. So you you found your lane then. So you were trying. It sounds like you were trying to be like, is it pop? Is it R and B? Is it that boom bap? You know that KRS is yeah, talking about. Like, what is it? What is it exactly and stuff? And I and I remember actually, I was trying to recollect. I remember there was a time like I, I think by like my final year where I finally figured out my voice. Where I was like, yo, you know what? I'm not I'm not like some pop artist. I'm not no pitbull dude or anything like that. You know what I mean? No just yeah. like making mad money, but mm -hmm. like um, you know. I was like, I'm not, that's not my passion. That's not where I'm at. And that's what I told you earlier in the interview. I was like, you know what? Um, this is starting to feel like a job for me. And yeah. I don't want it to feel like a job. I want to actually have fun doing it. And then that's when I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just gonna rap about whatever I want to rap about. Kick the door down, whatever. I'm gonna kick my feet up and do whatever I want. And then that's that's how like I started building this whole idea and this whole uh, thing. Like my first project project official one after like experimenting was this joint called Quran Chronicles, which you can mm -hmm. find on SoundCloud. And that was like early, raw, lazy, like like you 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 felt the potential. You felt the reach there. Like, oh no, nah, he's he's gonna go somewhere with this. Just wait and stuff. And then after that I made Live at the Mecca. And then after Live at the Mecca, I had a song called Freedom. And that record really kind of elevated me, catapulted me onto the scene and that gave me that social media presence that I got now and stuff. Yeah, and, and that's where I discovered you. So that's that's a good segue. Um, so you were on YouTube, you're on Instagram, you're on SoundCloud. What what was your thoughts about which you know platforms to be on? And was there one in particular that you felt that pop like freedom? Like where did that pop first? I'm sorry, hold on, hold on. You good, you good. You got a call? So, I apologize. Hold on. Yeah, somebody called me by accident. You straight, bro. You straight, bro. We're not we not on we not on TV, bro. So we good. All right. All right, cool. I'm so sorry. Can you tell me? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so you time? you were on Instagram, you were on YouTube, you're on SoundCloud, you're on all these platforms. And I think a lot of people could get educated just yeah. by the level of your grind. Like you talked about three to four years to find your lane before you started staying in it and to find that voice. So what I'm interested in is how did you approach like, I'm going to be on this platform. I'm not going to be on this platform yet. I'm going to throw money on advertising dollars on this platform and not yet. And then you said Freedom is one of those tracks that really got popping. Like... Which, which platform was it popping on or was it popping on all at the same time or was it one of those platforms you know that stuck out the most i mean for me it was instagram like first of all you you generally like as an artist you kind of want to be like on all the social media sites just because you know but then as you know like with these things it, it's kind of like a race to see who's the more popular one so for me i was like i'm gonna put my money on instagram which ended up instagram ended up being the leader in terms of social media right now, if you look at the hierarchy, it's like Instagram and then right behind it is Twitter. You know what yeah. I mean? So uh, for me, for Instagram, I was like, yo, this is great. I could post pictures, I could do videos, I can, you know, I could do advertisements and things and I got a lot of engagements on it. So I was like, okay, we're gonna rock out here. That's dope, man. I, I like that. So you were like experimenting and then you found which one was was rocking with the algorithm, the same algorithm that connected you and I in the first place, too. So that's yeah. a, <laughs> a shout out to the algorithm. Yep. <laughs> so uh, another thing that stuck out to me, again, this goes back to that that sh that Shaolin influence is you giving a shout out to Sun Tzu. And then, you know, I'm a Clipper fan now, so we, we got to represent for Kawhi, who you gave a shout out to. Talk to us a little bit about Sun Tzu and or Kawhi. Well, I mean, at that time, I was reading The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And uh, I was this the the line that I said, see, they moves coming through view from 100 paces. And there was a there was a line uh, in the book where it was like you 
um, should read your enemy like a uh, hundred paces ahead and stuff. And I liked it. I digged it and stuff. I was like, yo, I kind of fuck with that. I like that hundred paces. I want to use that in a bar. And oh, that's that's a little gem for all you MCs out there, like aspiring MCs. You really want to? You really want to do this? Do this? Read a book, man. A, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Books, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> open that. Open the. Book. Cause some of I could tell like some of my favorite MCs like like Jay like I could tell he reads a lot of philosophy books because some of the stuff that he be saying I was like like he be talking he be saying Socrates lines and like Socrates asks oh like, hold on just I'll clarify see. for us you mean Jay Z or Jay Electronica or Jay, Jay. Well, I'm from oh. New York so when we say when we say <laughs> Jay there's only one Jay like we say oh <laughs> pardon me uh, Jay Z right it's like I could tell like I could tell Jay definitely like reads a lot of philosophy books because like he'll he'll make a lot of socrates references so he, i remember one line he's like socrates asked whose bias do y'all seek like all the plato screech like i was like oh you know what i mean like you know these are all like little theories so that kind of inspires me like i'll read random books from time to time and catch like really dope lines that i feel like damn these are hidden like you could put bars into that shit you know what i mean but yeah you about to make me cry, bro. Nobody's out there telling people to read books. Like that's the realest thing. Read Years ago, a mortal technique ended one of his songs by saying, read, nigga, read. Like that was that was the last thing that affected me when I was like a, yeah. a teenager. You know what I mean? Well, so I'm, talking about, I'm talking about just MCs. Like all that other stuff that people are doing, like that that could be that that might be your your one two step. But I'm talking about like if you're really trying to be like on some shit like like the greats are doing, like they the greats read. I'm telling you that right now. Like even if they don't read the whole book. They read it. I promise you. So yeah, and to, and to back to your thing you said about the woo, the woo influences and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I mean, I just I would study I, like Method Man was my favorite and Ghostface and Ray. Like those guys. Like I was listening to Built for Cuban Links. That's one of my favorite albums. Um, I love Ghostface. I, I love Supreme Clientele. Like I tell people all the time. Like if you really want to learn how to do this, uh. One of my favorite suggestions is uh, listen to that Supreme Clientele album because uh, that I learned a lot of like about Ron Scheme and imagery because like his imagery was off the charts on that album. It's so vivid, man. They got so many. I mean, I just watched uh, their 36 Chamber Cinema stuff that they had with Shogun Assassin. So I got to listen to them again. And that's the original samples from which Jizz's Liquid Swords was taken. You know, like they had they had so much. Like you said, Raekwon the Chef, Ghostface, his collabos with MF Doom, too. Yeah, they, they, there's a lot of uh, deep stuff in there. Uh, a couple of times on the album, and we got Lamb already in, in the name of the project. You mentioned uh, being a carnivore. And I know this year, I don't know if you've been tracking it. So that's why I wanted to pick your head about this. I had a friend of mine who uh, also got an impressive beard. He was on the show recently. He's been a carnivore for a couple months. And then uh, there's a, a Dr. Sean Baker. I always catch him on, on Twitter. He's always preaching to be a carnivore. Joe Rogan back in January, before all this bumped up, he's trying to be a carnivore. So he had me curious, is Shalizi a carnivore or, or what's up with that? Or is that just like to, to I'll, let people know you a raw dude? Oh, I, the latter. The second part but I'm, I'm a balanced diet kind of dude you know what i'm saying i think i do a really good job with my diet and stuff i i tried the vegan thing for like four months but like it's not for me man like it, it's it's great i respect it but it, it's mad hard and stuff but i i respect a, a diet you know a balanced diet i gotta have my chicken to beef but i do like substitutes man there's a couple of um what is it like these um these, uh, what is it, like the Impossible yes. Burgers? Yeah, like yeah. the Impossible Burgers, Beyond Burgers. I like those. I like those. I can rock with them. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting, man, to see how all that stuff was. If I had just heard it once, I'd be like, okay, but I heard it a couple times on the project, and I was like, yo, he might be subliminally trying to get us to be carnivores, or he's just a real raw dude. <laughs> so yeah, I was just nah, I said, you're talking about the line stressing the grind turned us into some carnivores. That's just like basically saying, you know, that that grind will really turn you into like a hustler. Like you, you got you to gotta eat, you got to survive kind of thing. You know what I mean? Oh, I feel you. I feel you. Just as a Jay fan, I'm I'm sure I was like, okay, he might be double entendre, triple entendre, just like him too. So <laughs> I had to check. Yeah, yeah, of course. The multis, always about the multis. <laughs> so uh, that, that's been great, man. So merci for all the time. Dadash, is there any final message you got uh, for people or anything you want them to know about you and uh, any any specifics about the, the current project you said that you're working on? All right, the, the current project, I'm, that's deep in the wraps right now. We okay, ready to deep on the wraps. But, 
But what I will say is, if you enjoyed the interview, first of all, follow my man first, Killer Deacon. Absolutely do that, number one. Number two, after you hear these bars, come and follow the boy, Shaleezy, Habibi King, S-H-A-H-L-E-E-Z-Y. I'm real digital. I'm on all streaming platforms. And please go on my band camp if you'd like to. If you like what we're doing, you can go on my band camp page. You can purchase my albums. You can purchase my entire discography. Come up to date. And for every purchase, I promote your business. I give you a shout out. And uh, we just, you know, Wu-Tang's for the children, shots for the children. You know what I mean? And that's how we go ahead and do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Chodo hafez, Dadash. Chodo hafez.